Take your Bibles this evening, if you would, go to 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. Appreciate our young people singing for us tonight. Appreciate the song. What a great song, huh? That wonderful name, Jesus. Um, no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. What a precious, precious name. 2 Peter chapter number 1. As Missourians, we all are known for certain things. You go around this country and you tell somebody you're from Missouri, there are certain things that come to mind. Uh, and we embrace them for the most part. Uh, when somebody says that they're from Missouri, they know there's a few things about us. One of those, they know our, our state motto. How many know what the state motto is? Show me. Yeah. Uh, we are hard to convince of anything, and you've got to show us some things to prove some things to us. In fact, we're so stubborn, our state mascot is a mule. <laughs> that tells you how stubborn Missourians are. And uh, what a reflection on us, huh, uh, to think about that. But, that is, uh, it, but it speaks not just to Missourians. Yeah, it's, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a cross-the-board human nature kind of a thing. Uh, you know, and sometimes we find ourselves falling into that same trap of, uh, well, you got to show it to me, you got to prove it to me, uh, and then I'll and then I'll believe. Uh, as we're looking here in Second Peter chapter one tonight, we have 
the Apostle Peter continuing to write to these believers and he shares some things here with them under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and he gives them some things to hang their hat on. Let me just remind you going back here to verse number 15 uh, or verse 14 I should say. He says this here, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. There's, some, there's, a, there, there's a lot of comfort in having somebody that you've had around in your life that has been a spiritual mentor, a spiritual rock for you, a spiritual teacher uh, that just um, that gives you a certain amount of comfort. Uh, Brother Danny and I were talking a little bit last night about some of those uh, folks like that, we're reminiscing a little bit about Brother Parker and just uh, how he was just that constant rock and uh, I couldn't help but watching these young people sing up here this evening uh, just the smile that would be on his face to know that here it is a fourth generation that is still singing about Jesus. Uh, but boy, I thank God for, for, my, for my preacher uh, growing up. I thank God for a man like Brother Clifford Rice who would come through and preach the Word of God and uh, there was few like him and whenever God made him he broke the mold. Um, and I just, I love Brother Rice. I love Brother Rice so much. Um, others that came along uh, that, that I was fortunate to have, Brother Epps was my pastor for just a short amount of time, but he was a, uh, meant a lot to me uh, whenever he was our pastor then when we lived down in Dexter and other men that God has brought along our way. But whenever, and I can remember whenever the, the men that talked to me about coming and they uh, asked me to consider to come here and one of the, one of the appealing things for me was to have uh, Brother Parker down the, the hallway from me and to be able to ask him, what do I do with these stubborn people? Uh, no, 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 that, I'm sorry, that was, I was reading about Moses today. Never, I'm wrong, wrong, wrong. No, but I was looking forward to having him down the hall and um, to get that call in August that he had gone on home to heaven broke my heart. It really did because uh, there was a mentor, there was somebody that I knew I could lean on that was suddenly gone. And sometimes when that happens, our world gets shaken and we begin to wonder, what am I going to do? All of a sudden they are gone. These people here that Peter's writing to are in a very similar situation. Now, they didn't have a Brother Parker for 44 years. They had an Apostle Peter for some 20, 30 years. Uh, that's, so, you know, I, I, I have a lot of admiration for Brother Parker, but Brother Parker did not walk with Jesus in the physical sense, in the physical body. He did not observe things here. And so, whatever he would, you know, Peter would say, now, Jesus told me. <laughs> Jesus really told him. I mean, he was telling things that he had actually had that. And so, can you imagine how much uh, strength was drawn from that? And here's Peter saying, hey, look, folks, I'm about to leave this world. I'm about to leave this world. Jesus told me I was going to be crucified uh, for him, and that time is, is, is very near for me. Yeah. And boy, as you get that news, you kind of get a little bit shaken. You, you start to be wondering, well, what, what, what are we supposed to do then? What are we supposed to do whenever you're all, you're all gone? Uh, what, what are we supposed to hang our hat on? Uh, who are we supposed to look to? And notice what he says here in verse 16. He says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. We made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Peter, as he begins to take them down this road here, he says, Now look, fellas, uh, look, church, I, I've seen some things and I've experienced some things. And what I'm telling you, uh, these are not fables. What, what, I'm, what I'm giving you, an eyewitness account of, they were not fables. Uh, and what, what Peter wants to draw them to is this here is the surety of, their, uh, of, of the accounts that has, has been given to them, uh, what would eventually make up our Bible uh, as that was still in the process of being written as Peter's writing these things down to them. He said, I just want to let you know the things that we're telling you, they're not made up. He said, uh, the things that are in this book, this Bible that you have, uh, it is a book of integrity. It's a book that you can be sure of. It, it's not this, uh, uh, this, these things that are made up. That word fable comes from the same word we get the word myth from. A lot of mythology 
A lot, you know, we, uh, I, I remember when I was in high school, I was always uh, enamored, if you will, a little bit with Greek mythology and just some of the, the stories that were in there and just how it was so interesting to read those things. And, and what Peter said, oh, look, I, and by the way, Peter lived in that time period whenever Greek mythology was at its zenith. It was, uh, people believed it and they grabbed onto it. In fact, the Romans had taken Greek mythology and they had uh, put their own uh, spin on it. It was the same stuff. It was all the same thing. Just they had a different names. That's all. They they just changed the names. It was the same religion, just different names. And so this is what all the religion these people have been in all their lives was mythology. And he said, look, this is not mythology. This is not fables. Hey, this is not Aesop giving you some uh, little story and then giving you a little uh, uh, a principle at the end, a little moral to live by. No, no, no. We've got something much more uh, uh, firm than just a fable or a made up story. In fact, uh, keep your finger here at 2 Peter. We're going to come back. Go with me to the book of Titus. The book of Titus. Uh, look at chapter number one with me, if you will. Titus, uh, this is the apostle Paul writing to Titus, and he is uh, pastoring a church there in Crete. And he's trying to uh, lead these believers here. In a, and boy, what a group he had to deal with. Uh, you read the, uh, their testimony, those, those uh, Christians, they, they weren't known for uh, integrity for sure. Uh, but notice here in verse 14, uh, he tells them here, uh, with, uh, let's, let's back up to verse 13. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So be careful about these who make up these stories and they come in and say, well, uh, this is some things that we have. And so he warns about Jewish fables. Uh, Jewish, well, well, that sounds really neat. That, well, God did that. You know, well, he said, wait, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Don't give heed to that stuff. Uh, take it back to the Word of God, if you will. In fact, go back with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. He deals with Timothy on this very same thing. Then verse number for he says this here, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Uh, I'm not to bring things in here to cause your faith to become weakened. Uh, instead, I'm here to strengthen your faith and try to build your faith and, and get you to point yourself back to the Word of God. And, and so while Paul says, Timothy, don't go uh, to these uh, fables here. Uh, don't give heed to them. In fact, turn over just a page maybe for you in chapter 4, verse 7 of 1 Timothy. He says this, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Uh, we got to be, we got to differentiate between what is Bible and what is just a wives' fable that he says here. That's what he calls it, and that's that's true. You know, there are some things that people say, and they say, well, that's in the Bible, and it's not in the Bible. Uh, you know, I remember hearing somebody say this one time: cleanliness is next to godliness. That's in the Bible. <laughs> Chapter and verse, please. They couldn't give it to you. Now, I hope you took a bath. <laughs> I hope you cleaned up. I'm not against being clean at all. I believe we all should do that. But it is not next to godliness. That's not in the Bible. And so while we, if we're not careful, we begin to elevate, and this is what the Pharisees did, they elevated traditions to the same level as the Bible. How many have ever read Aesop's Fables? Okay, we've read a few of them. Uh, I remember in school we had to read some of those. I got the book in my uh, office there, and uh, there are some good illustrations and whatnot that you can use for that. And there are some good moral teaching, but can I just tell you, Aesop's Fables are not on the same level as the Bible. Okay. We understand that, right? And so that's what he's getting. I said, look, don't, don't give heed to those things. But here's the thing. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're real close there. In verse 1 he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Repure, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. The church, there's going to come a day, and yea, we may be in that very day where the church is much more interested in hearing fables than they are in hearing the truth. Yeah. 
A fable is just some the man's opinion, if you will, has been elevated to the same uh, uh, same authority as God's word. And he said, that, that, he said the, the end times is going to be like that, where people are going to uh, do that. Uh, that book that you hold in your hands tonight, that book that's sitting on your lap right now, uh, that is not a book of fables. Rather, it is the book of truth. And it is everything within that, and the pages of, the, of that book is true. Uh, there are eyewitnesses' accounts uh, that have been given to us uh, here of these things, and we can read all about those things. Uh, the fundamentals of our faith that we build our faith upon, the virgin birth, the, the sinless life of Christ, the atoning death, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ, the return of Christ. Those things are based on, uh, on what the Bible says, and those are not just made up things. They, those are not things that have just been rolled out there just to kind of scare you into uh, living right. No, those things are true. Uh, th th those are truth. They're not just a mythology, if you will. Uh, the works that Christ did while He was here on earth. Think about what He did as He walked uh, here on this earth. Uh, we have seen nobody else do this here, but can and you see as, as he stood on in that boat that night as the storm was raging around and he simply said the words, peace be still. And suddenly that, 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 that sea just became placid, calmed. The Bible says the disciples were afraid because of the power of the voice of Christ. Yeah. The night as they are on in that boat again, and there's another situation where they're in the boat and they're they're in the middle of a storm, and next thing you know, here comes Jesus walking on the water. Nobody else has ever done that. That's not just some made up story to make you go, wow, uh, that's, that's something else, isn't it? Boy, isn't that an amazing story? It's not a fable, uh, him turning uh, the water into wine, him feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, and uh, feeding the 4,000 with seven loaves and a few uh, little fishes, uh, uh, him uh, cleansing the lepers, those who were set on death and watching their bodies decay right in front of their eyes. And, and he would come and he would touch them, uh, he would speak to them, uh, he would heal them. Hey, that was real. Uh, that, that really happened. Uh, that was not some made up story to make you think, wow, what a man. No, this was a real a historical fact that this happened. And boy, if we could, one of these days, I hope we get to get to heaven and we get to talk to some of these people that experienced these things and say, what was it like? Uh, what happened that day uh, whenever God, uh, whenever Christ came by and, and he touched you or he spoke to you and he healed you uh, as he talked to blind Bartimaeus there on the, on the road, uh, there at the side of the road. He says, bring him up to me. He says, what do you want there, Bartimaeus? He said, that I may receive my sight. And he says, you got it. And he gave him his sight. And right immediately after all those years of being blind, suddenly his eyes were open. Listen, that was not made up. There were hundreds of people around that saw it happen. They knew it. Uh, they said, hey, this is the real deal. I, I like what in the book of John where it talks about, they said, we've seen his works and we know uh, that this is the one who has come from the Father. Uh, his works speak to him. Listen, there were people who watched and knew the people that had these things happen to him. Uh, can you imagine even those who were against him as Malchus came out that day uh, with all the rest of the people there to take Jesus, to take him to the, uh, to the hall to be tried. And as Peter took that sword out and whacked that ear off, and Jesus just simply picked the ear up and put it back on. He didn't use super glue. He didn't use some rubber band or something. No, he just put it back on and it, he, it just went right back on. I can't wait to talk to Lazarus. We'll all understand what it is to go from here to there one day. But what was it like to be taken from there to come back here? <laughs> Where you're like, oh, God, do we really have to do this? Yeah. I mean, I, we just spent a lot of time. I, I'd rather just not go. Four days he had been in heaven. And yet Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And immediately he comes hopping out of the grave. So that, that funeral procession was going along there. And he said, uh, uh, you know, he stopped that funeral procession and he, uh, they told him what was going on. It was a lady's son. It was her only son. And, and so he, he took the guy, a uh, young man by the hand and raised him up. And he, he sat up in that, in that beer there. And they took him down. And the funeral was all done. Yeah. Turn around and go home. Yeah. All of a sudden everything. Can you, can you imagine that? Hey, people were there. They saw it. They saw it with their own eyes. Peter was there. He says, I got an eyewitness account for you. I can tell you what I saw. I can tell you all about those things. He said, I've told you about it. I've shared with you all those things. Go on with me here. Go back to 2 Peter, if you will, chapter 1. 
He says, we haven't followed these cunningly devised fables. We, uh, we, we haven't uh, put these things out and, and, and devised these things. No, no. These were things that were known. Uh, people knew about this here. And we've told you about the, uh, the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. And he goes into something here that was very interesting that only three human beings saw. He takes them to the Mount of Transfiguration. So let me tell you about the power and the glory we got to see that day. Notice here in verse 17, For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Oh my, can you imagine as Peter's relaying the story and he's giving him all the, uh, the details of this here and he's reminded, said, don't you remember me telling you about this here? Uh, Peter had taught them concerning the power of Christ and his return, but boy, this one event, this one event just seemed to stand out to him as, uh, of Jesus' earthly ministry. And he, he said, let me just tell you about the day this happened. Uh, um, myself and, and James and John, we were taken up into this mountain. While we were up there, we saw Christ transfigured before us. We saw His humanity set aside for a little bit. And we saw the glory of His deity. And, and boy, what an amazing thing that we got to see. I'm, I'm always interested as you're reading here in 2 Peter compared to the account in the Gospels where the uh, Gospels talk about the fact that they were, saw Moses and Elijah and Jesus in His glory. And they were all amazed by this here. But when we get to here in 2 Peter, and Peter's going back to that time, he forgot all about Moses and Elijah. Yeah. Those guys pale in comparison. He said, let me just tell you what we saw. Let me tell you what we saw that day. We, uh, we, we've been witnesses to the power of God. We've been witnesses to what He did through His Son. But this particular thing here, uh, uh, we were able to see, and I want to just uh, give you an account of this again, that we, we heard the voice of God. We heard God speak. But what an amazing thing to hear the audible voice of God. They had to be unlike anything they've ever heard. Something that no doubt just, just put an indelible mark on their mind that uh, this was, this, they were in the presence of something uh, amazing. He said, uh, we heard that uh, coming straight from God Himself. And he, he, He's giving to His Son honor and glory. The, the adulation the Father was giving to the Son. He said, uh, we, we heard it. We heard Him uh, uh, be so proud of His Son, if you will, uh, in our vernacular there. that He was so uh, rejoicing over his, his willingness to do what His plan was for Him. He uses that phrase there, such a voice. That's, a, that's an exclamation. He said, oh, that voice. Oh, that voice. What an amazing voice. What a powerful voice. But what, what an impact it had on us. And, and as he's going through and he's sharing these things, he talks about the excellent glory that was given to, uh, to, uh, to Christ, uh, that magnificence, that majesty. And then to hear the testimony of God Himself for His Son when He says, This is my beloved Son. In case there was any question of who Jesus is, this is God's Son. Yeah. No question. Peter said, I was there. I stood on the mount uh, and, I, and, I was, and I heard it all happen. And I heard God say, this is my beloved son. Uh, if there was ever any doubt in our mind that Jesus was and is the Christ, he said, all doubt was removed that day as we heard God himself say, this is my beloved Son. He goes on to give testimony of, of God Himself of what Jesus did. He said, uh, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He's done all things well. And everybody else can complain about my son, and they can say he's this and that. They can say he's doing these things in the power of Beelzebub. Uh, they can say he's, uh, he's, uh, he's eating with publicans and sinners. Uh, he's this, he's that. He said, but I just want to let you know, here's what God thought. God said, I am well pleased. Don't worry about what everybody else is saying. 
Don't get caught up in, in trying to pander to the crowd. Uh, listen, Jesus had no, no desire to pander the crowd. He said, I'm just listening to the voice of my Father, and I heard what my Father said. He said, I'm well pleased. I'll take that any day over everything else. And Peter, as he's sitting there, he said, boy, what an amazing thing uh, to hear that voice from heaven. Uh, Peter, along with those other two witnesses there, has seen what no other has seen and will not see until we are in his presence. And so that begs the question, are we in a lesser time then? I haven't seen Jesus do a single miracle. I haven't seen him walk of this, this earth. I haven't seen him touch the blinded eyes. I haven't seen him raise the lame. I haven't seen him cause the dumb to speak. I haven't seen him raise the dead. I don't have the opportunity to go to a place called the Mount of Transfiguration and to hear the voice of God in an audible, physical, audible, audible voice. And so, are we on a lesser place? No, we're not. In fact, I want you to hear what Peter says. He says this here. He says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Amen. Yes. Peter's saying, I don't need to be from Missouri. I don't need you to show me what I have is something that is more sure than anything these eyes have seen, these ears have heard, uh, these hands have handled. I've got something more sure, and it is this precious book that we hold in our hands. He said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Oh, sure, it would have been great to see those things, but it, don't, don't discount the fact that you, are, that you don't get to see them. All you get to do is read about them. Listen, uh, he says, uh, th more sure than, the, than what your eyes could see, this book is more sure than what your eyes can see. He said, you can build your faith upon this thing here, uh, this book that God's given to you. Now notice what he says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Uh, you've got something here that sits in your hands. And, and I know you may say, oh, I wish I could be like Peter. I wish I could see Jesus have done all those things. Oh, I wish I could have been on the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, don't discount the fact of what you do have and don't go wishing away and say, oh, I wish I had this and I wish I had that when you've got something that is more sure. You've got a more sure word uh, that you hold in your hands this evening. And what a blessing that is. Uh, such authentic and awesome voices and visions as characterize the Mount of Transfiguration have their place, no doubt. But they cannot be compared with the Word of God with that more sure word of prophecy, one man said. He said, don't, don't think you have to have an experience. We've got a lot of folks looking for an experience today. Yeah. And they're more interested in having experience and having a tingle up their spine than they are in having something settled in, something that is unchanging, and something that you can, uh, you can put your faith in, that you know that it's going to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hey, that's your Bible that you have. You've got something you can build your faith upon. Thank God that you have uh, such a, a wonderful gift that He's given to you. Uh, many people today still they lightly set aside the Word of God in favor of visions of dubious sorts and Voices of unknown origin. Yeah. We've got plenty of TV shows about that, don't we? People are enamored with those things. and they, They're taken by those things. But can I tell you, it's a dangerous practice. It's a dangerous place to go walking down. Voices and visions can uh, originate from Satan, uh, satanic and demonic sources. Uh, drugs can induce them. Uh, false religions and various cults of Christendom have frequently been based on such deceptive phenomena. We got to listen. Uh, don't don't uh, steer away from this wonderful book that you have. And boy, if those voices, those spirits come and they begin to uh, take you some, uh, some direction that's away from this book, hey, uh, you need to turn those voices off. You need to turn aside from those things and say, no, the Bible says, oh, I know what the Bible says, but hey, there's where the conversation stops. We need to stop the conversation right there and say, no, uh, we're not going any further. Uh, the Bible says should be our, our answer. Their occult religions are motivated by satanic voices and spurious visions. 
We have an entire religion that is based on somebody who saw some golden tablets yeah. with some rose colored glasses and an angel named Moroni. Yeah. They should just take the eye off the end and give us the real name of Moron. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got millions, millions that are following this. And it all goes back to a vision. A vision that some guy had in the hills of New York. And nobody else can see those tablets. And nobody else can find those rose colored glasses. Well, isn't that convenient? We, we are so easily taken. And we're so interested in the phenomenon. Uh, you know, um, there, there's this story about the UFO sighting out here at Clearwater Lake. We made it to TV, folks. Did you know that? They did a whole half hour special on us. Bunch of weirdos. <laughs> and we're so taken by that, but we won't believe the unchanging Word of God. Listen, we've got to be careful. Satan will put anything out there for us. He'll do whatever he needs to. In fact, the Bible says he'll come to you like a angel of light, a minister of light. He'll, he'll make himself look good. He'll do all he needs to. But listen, we've got to be watchful. Legions of lying spirits in the unseen world are clamoring to be heard and heeded, and millions of deluded people who will not have the Bible at any price eagerly embrace phenomena emanating from the deceiver himself. That's the world we live in. We've got to be careful that we're not taken and drawn in by those same things. Notice here he says for us in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. He said, God, is, there's not some hidden meaning in the, in the Word of God. It's very clear what is in there for us. It says the important step for each one of us is uh, there, I'm back up in verse 19, he says the important step is that we take heed to what the Bible says. Everything that comes across uh, this pulpit, everything that gets taught in these Sunday school classrooms, it, it is to emanate from the Word of God. It is to be based on the Word of God uh, and not to uh, take one passage and, and cause it where it conflicts with it. No, we, we, we study the Bible out and we make sure that our doctrine lines up with this book. I don't care what your, uh, your opinions are. I want to know what does the Bible say? Amen. we got to be careful that we're not entertained Sometimes I hear preaching and I wonder, what did we just listen to? We heard a verse of Scripture read and then we heard 30 stories. That's not preaching. Preaching is coming back to the Word of God. Preaching is taking the Word of God and expounding the Word of God and saying, hey, thus saith the Lord. It's, it's not about what my experience has been. Uh, thank God for our experiences. I, hey, I'm glad to know that I've had some uh, where, where I can look back and see where God moved and God worked in my heart and my life, and I'm thankful for that. But listen, if what I thought God was working goes against what this book says, can I tell you the book trumps my experience every time. Amen. And that's what he's trying to get through to his, uh, these believers, these, uh, these who are, are looking to him to be a help to them. He said, look, for, I know I can tell you all about what I have experienced, and I can tell you what I've seen, and I know what I've seen is true, and I know this Christ is, is the Son of God. I heard it with my very own ears, but can I tell you something uh, that, that is more sure than what I saw, and uh, more sure than what I heard is the book that you hold in your hands. Thank God for that book He's given to you. He says this here, it is a more sure word. Prophecy, He says, came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved. They were moved by the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, what we have in front of us here is not just uh, some, some things that man put together and some things that he came up with. No, uh, God had, had taken over the, uh, the span of some 1,600 years and, and some 40 plus men that he had used to, to write down these things. He did not leave it to them to formulate what he wanted. Rather, he moved them to write down uh, the, the very words he desired for us to have. And even after writing down the words of scriptures, uh, these went back to search out what they had written to understand what God was teaching. In 1 Peter chapter 1 uh, verse number 10 he says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. The prophets wrote about this grace that was coming and they stood back and they looked at this and said, What is this? What, what is this I've just written down? 
What does this all mean? Why? That's, that's the, that was the Holy Spirit saying, this is what I want you to write down. Uh, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. He said, uh, they, they stood back and they were in awe of what they had just written down. Not because of any ability they had, but because the Holy Spirit had moved them to write these things down. The book we hold was given to us by the Holy Spirit. It does not merely contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. And if God went to so much trouble to make sure it was His Word being written, doesn't it stand to reason that He would preserve it for the generations to follow, to have His words in their hands? I believe that we hold the very Word of God in our hands. And I believe we can trust this book to guide us, to direct us, to enlighten us, to encourage us, to exhort us to the way God would have us get to heaven through His perfect plan of salvation. To lead us to live holy lives that are pleasing to Him. And what a precious gift He has given to us. What a blessed gift. And by the way, that's why the devil's working overtime to try to dilute this thing and try to water it down. That's why there's, listen, you, you go to your, uh, your local bookstore, you go online and you'll find some 50 versions of the Bible. But you only find one version of the Book of Mormon. Huh. You'll find some 50 versions of the Bible out there, but you only find one version of the Book of Quran. Interesting. You take those Bibles as they are printed and they, uh, uh, they will uh, remove certain things out of some Bibles. They'll add things in in other Bibles. They'll switch things around. They'll change the language. They'll change the words. They'll do all kinds of things. Why? To provide confusion. Yeah. They want confusion in the church. Yes. Satan doesn't want to. And can he, he wants everybody lockstep and, uh, uh, with everything in the, in the church of Latter-day Saints. He wants them to be on the same page. Because it's the false page. He wants all those in that uh, false religion of Islam to be on the same page and following the same thing. Why? Because it's a satanic thing. But this book, he knows it's the true Word of God. And so we're not going to leave that alone and say we're going to mess with it as much as we can and we're going to try to uh, uh, turn it inside out and cause folks to have so much confusion that they'll fight and bicker and war over that instead of trying to live according to the dictates of the Bible. Many a skeptic has come through time and has tried to tear down this book. I believe it was Voltaire who said that by the time of his, by the time he would draw his last breath, he would make sure every copy of the Bible was removed from the country of France. That was his goal. I was told some, I guess it was about, a, about 50 years ago, I don't know if it's still true or not, but they said that Voltaire's house had been converted into a Bible publishing Amen. plant instead. Amen. God has a sense of humor. <laughs> listen, there, there's been many who have tried to tear this book down. And that's, listen... We may lose, we may have those who are our mentors, we may have those who have had a great influence in our life, and God may call them home. But just because they're off the scene doesn't change this book. Peter said, look, I'm about to go and be with Jesus. My time is at hand. I'm about to leave. And you will no longer get a letter from the Apostle Peter. And you will no longer hear another message from the Apostle Peter. And you may be one of those in that church at Corinth says, I'm of Peter, and I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Christ. And listen, uh, we're all going to be off the scene uh, uh, soon enough, but here's what's going to be lasting is this book. You're going to have this book, and God has given you this book. And so put your eyes on this book and settle your faith in this book. The poet John Clifford many years ago wrote this little poem, and I love this poem. It says this here, Last Eve I paused beside the blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring of vesper chime. Then looking in I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, asked I, to wear and beat these hammers so? Just one, said he. And then with twinkling eye, the anvils wear the hammers out, you know. 
And so I thought, the anvil of God's Word. For ages skeptics' blows beat upon, yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed, the hammer's gone. There will be many who will come along even after we're off this scene of Christ has not returned soon. And they will question the Word of God, and they will beat on this, and they will try to remove, they'll try to remove all confidence in the book. But just because there are those who are skeptics, and just because there are those who will fight against it, does not undo the truths of this book. Amen. Tonight, can I just remind you of this here? We have a more sure word of prophecy. Amen. We have a more sure word that we can build our lives upon. We don't have to worry about, well, that person's experience, well, that person thinks this and that. No, no, no. What does the book say? Amen. What does the book say? Go back and be like our brothers and sisters in Christ of centuries ago who were simply known as people of the book. Because everything came back to that question. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? God help us tonight.